Because this is 
Lupus Awareness Sunday. Because this is Lupus Awareness Sunday, I wanted to make sure that we have this whole area, or this whole time around the celebration of or that the testimony first from these that have lived with lupus, but also around what we can do to help further the um, the learning and the finding out about this this bless, this disease or plague, so that healing can take place. Amen. And the more that we can help, we're going to donate at the end. We're going to show you all some ways that you can donate. The church is going to send a special offering. And then I'm going to ask those here, you may want to give a special offering today. But the ladies that are coming today, I've known both of them um, almost all their lives. I've known Shanette since she was in her, in her single digits at least. Amen. And then I've known Shayana all of her life. So I have um, Shayana coming. She's actually my cousin, um, but I look at her as a niece, and she respects me as an uncle. And so um, she has, um, so Shayana Lane has been um, diagnosed with lupus in her teens, and she came to share her story with us today. And then we're going to have also uh, Mrs. Shanette Campbell. Amen. And she's going to come. And she's going to share her story with us. Amen. Known her since she was a young, young, young one. Amen. You were you five? She was five when we um, first got to know each other. And she's blossomed into a lovely, beautiful, lovely young lady and married a very nice, handsome, strong, big guy. Amen. And they, they have gotten some wonderful kids that are doing some awesome things. Amen. And I want y'all to hear their story because I know their stories. I want y'all to hear it so that you can be blessed by it. Amen. Thank you, Lady Renee. Lady Renee said, give them some more time back. Amen. So come on. After the, our praise ensemble comes, we're going to hear from um, Shanette, Shanette Campbell and Sister Shayana Lane. We'll hear from Shayana first and then followed up by Sister Shanette.
you guys. My name is Shayana Lane. Please bear with me. First, I'm an athlete. And April 2019, the week of 2019, um, my dad decided to give our basketball team a week off from practice, basketball practice. And instantly, a few hours, my body started shutting down. I became tired constantly. I actually stayed with a best friend of mine. And I just kept falling asleep. And I feel like I was drugged. And I just kept going, because I'm like, you know, I'm kicking it with my best friend. But it wasn't normal. Um, we went to church and I just kept falling asleep and falling asleep and, you know, I'm in church so I can't leave. Um, we went over to a house after for dinner and I fell asleep and I said, you know, I need to go to the hospital. Um, I ran fevers for two days after and I finally went to the hospital. Um, I was really told to take Tylenol and go home. Um, I went to Children's Hospital, and by the time me and my mother got home, they told me to come back to the ER because you had protein and your kidneys were leaking blood. And so in about a few days, I was found to be told that I was dying if I didn't make it to the hospital when I did. Um, I went, and unlike some people, we don't know what lupus was. We never heard of it. It's not in our family. and it was just this big thing that shattered my life because like I said, I played basketball, that was the love of my life. And to be told, you can't play no more. You can't do this, you can't do that. Take these medicines and this is what you have for the rest of your life. I didn't know what to think, but I knew I had to keep going. So the next thing, me and my dad laid there, and what we do next? What we gotta do next? And so I did that, scared, didn't want to go to school, took about 15 different medicines. My face, my face blew up, but if I didn't go to school, I couldn't play basketball. Today I thought, if I didn't go to school and if I didn't play basketball, where would I be today? <laughs> that saved me until my body started shutting down. I learned stress was a response for me. That's why I played sports. I needed a way to do something better. And because I like basketball, I did what I wanted to do. I don't know where I would be if I didn't have or wasn't active in my life today. That helped me along the way of dealing with this illness, coping with stress and everything. Um, I went through a lot. Um, the beginning of my years, I went into a coma. Like, it was really bad. Um, people didn't know I would make it, and I think today, well, why have such little faith? For me, you know, I'm fighting, I'm this athlete. I've never been sick a day in my life. You think I'm just gonna go out like that? So, okay, what we gotta do? Still, I would ask and question the doctors over and over, nobody could give me an answer. So as time progressed from, 20, from 07 to 2010, it was like, you're put, you have to go on emergency dialysis. After two weeks of going to the hospital, that's, that's what I have to do. Okay, 
it was hard. Um, I gained weight, I gained water weight, I couldn't open my eyes, things were just happening and I couldn't believe it. But I never said why, I never said how and who. What do we have to do so that I could survive my life and keep going? So I did that, it was hard, don't get me wrong. You know, who wants to do that at 18? You know, who wants to be sick at 15, taking 20 medicines? I don't think anybody, but I know where I came from and I know the fight in me, inside of me, not physically, outside. And I said, you know, I have to keep going. If it's for me, it could help other people, but this is something new to me. And I have to do what I came and I was created on earth to do. Um, as time progressed, I stayed on dialysis for 11 years. Any and everything hit me from left to right, the top of my head to the bottom of my soul and my feet. And me and my family, we had no clue. Neither did the doctors. And that's what just let me know, like, if y'all don't know, it's something greater happening in my life. And I have time and God is on my side. Yeah. <laughs> so with, you know, prayer and trying to make sure I'm good and staying away from things and researching and all of the above, I learned if they don't know, now it's time for me to find out what I gotta do, what I gotta research, what I, who I gotta find, what doctor I need to talk to. But then it was like, okay, but it starts with me. And at the end of the day, if that coma didn't completely kill me, and I'm still here again, <laughs> the doctors ain't got the last say so in my life. So I went on to battle, like I said, all kind of different diseases and illness from 2010 to 2014. I literally didn't take pictures of myself between 2010 to 2013. I, I didn't want to be outside, I didn't want to go and conquer the world, but unfortunately I was on dialysis and somehow I still had to be seen. So I did it still with grace and mercy, you know, with God on my side and not worried about anybody else. I did that, I caught, you know, badness and not coping with dialysis the way I should, which led me to, you know, my heart stopping and too much liquid and overflow, whatever the case may be. But it taught me that I could beat this, that I'm better than this and that if I learn knowledge, that I can complete this and conquer this. And that's what I did, so I started learning everything. I started seeing what I needed to do, what I needed to drink, what stressors I needed to get away from in order for I to survive. And I did that and my life started getting better. Pain started, the cycle started leaving and I started speaking it over my life. Yeah. Yeah. It, was, um, it was a lot of comas. I don't know the exact number that I've been in, but it's like, if them ain't killing me yet today, <laughs> what you say don't matter to me. Like I can believe you and I can take this medicine, don't get me wrong, and I may need it. But not all of it is the completion of why I'm still here today. And so, you know, I, I continued to listen, but then I did my work. I looked, I, I called on God, I looked at scriptures, I looked at things that as a person going through something and you have no clue, but you are in care of my life, and you can't tell me why, I gotta do the work. I gotta work on me, I gotta do everything I can, and I did that. I, invested and I spent money on this and I spent money on that just trying to be okay each and every day. And it was hard. Like, don't give me, it was hard. Stressed out, it was hard. Go to the doctor, it was hard. But why is this happening to me? Nobody knows. That means time is on my side and God knows everything. And, and so I kept going. My last coma was in 2018. I was doing good, doing great. And all of a sudden, I passed out and I was in a coma for about three weeks. I was on life support, ventilator. But in my last coma, it was like I tell my dad, my eyes could move, but I couldn't open them. And I, don't, I haven't shared that with everyone, because not everyone will understand. But that last one told me that I was ready to come out into the world and beat everything that has came against me. And I've been doing that silently. And Still, not everybody understand, but it's not for nobody else to understand. And 
I ask today on many occasions as of this past year, if I can go through all of that and still go through that, and I didn't die after being resuscitated and going through these things, what is my greater purpose here? What do I need to be, what, who I need to be in this season, that season, the next season or whatever it is for my life to keep going the way it should be? And right now I'm in a, a season of stagnancy where it's just like, just listen to what he tells you to do. Not everybody will understand that, but it's only for me, and I'm okay with that. And that's what I've been doing to keep me peaceful, keep me out of pain, keep me out of everything. I don't have pain on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, but I programmed to believe that I would, didn't come here with pain, first of all. I didn't come here with this, first of all, so if I didn't come here with that, I don't have to live with it all day, every day either. I don't have to take these medicines but I saw a cycle of, if I hold on to it, it'll stay. So, you know, it's a battle every day, but I'm learning to progress through it. I'm learning to look up those scriptures and, and listen all day, every day. And for someone like us, lupus attacks, stress is the stress. Stress is the trauma from it. And some people act on their stress. You get behavior, you get physical, you get different things. We suffer in silence. And that silence manifests into physical symptoms. And not everybody will agree and say it because they haven't realized that themselves. But that's the truth. And things just hit us even harder sometimes and all we can do is fight. Because at the end of the day, we was created for this life. Not everybody can walk in our shoes. It's a battle every day, but I still choose that. Because if, if I give up, no matter about the other people, I can't give up on myself. I come this far, I went through this and I went through that and I still don't ask why, but I know why. And so I just keep going as much as I can because if I don't, what else am I gonna do? You know, um, lupus has taught me, it can be hereditary, it can be environmental, it can be chemicals, whatever. I don't know if you guys are aware of what lupus is, but lupus attacks your system. It attacks our, our, our healthy, strong body as it's born, developing, is overactive. And it turns against us. Instead, it hits us internally. And it ain't too much we can do about it, you know. Um, but cry out, say it, and that's sometimes hard to believe. So we deal with it internally, and that causes a lot more things. But it's, until I read the scripture, you know, do not be anxious or lean on to your own understanding helped and saved my life. Because nobody around me, no friends, no peers can relate to anything I am saying today or was there to understand me. But those scriptures have kept me here today. And if I didn't have any of those scriptures, I wouldn't be alive today. And like, that's the, I can thank my family, I can thank people to be there, but then God kept me alive here, not nobody else. And so I can give credit to all, but he the only one that's keeping me sitting on this stage today. Like I told my cousin Keith, you know, I know what my calling is. I know, I know all, I knew that since I was a girl, a little girl. But I can't just go out and step out and do it yet till he tell me to. So until he asked me, it was like, you know, I had already been writing down and stamping things and trying to get myself out there. When I communicate with people, I'm getting myself out there. But I said, you know, this is what I need in whatever season I'm going into right now because I've been in a, a very low season. So the people outside, oh, you're great, you're doing this. You don't know what I feel inside. You don't know how angry I could be inside. You don't know, but you don't see it. So for me, it's just, I told them thank you, because I needed to express this about myself. You can think what you want, but that helped me get out here today. It's hard, yeah, I still go through it, but not everybody can relate and just to have today to speak with also someone else. It's a very great opportunity for me to be here today because the enemy tried to attack me last night um, on many ways. It's like my Aunt Nay asked me, well, do you got your speech ready? Do you got your paper ready? I'm like, well, wait a minute. He said five to 10 minutes. Like, you, I can't explain lupus in five to 10 minutes. It just don't work that way. I went to sleep. I couldn't wake, I couldn't wake up. I woke up and then I, Somehow in a dream, I got a call that said, 
we're canceling, I'll see you next week. And I said, well, wait a minute, you know, everybody's coming out here to see this. Why would you tell me to cancel? And so it's like, okay, Shayana, I don't prepare for things, because I'll freak out. I'll wait to the moment to do so, scared and do it. Because if I prepare, I won't know what to say. I, if I couldn't, I wouldn't come up here today. I can do it sitting down in that seat, just scared and don't know what I'm gonna say until I get right here. And so I made it today. I didn't know, I know I had to be here, but it took me a minute to actually accept that I had to be here. But I did make it and I just wanna say thank you for you guys all coming and understanding what lupus is a struggle to us. I'm glad I don't look like what none of them pictures look like. I'm glad I don't look like what I've been through. And I appreciate you guys all for being here today. Thank you. Shane, so will, you, will you share about the transplant real quick before you? Also, um, after 11 years in dialysis, long wait on the transplant list, no control over my life. In May 19, May 2019, I wrote kidney transplant positive, oh, find me. I was working at the Oakland Museum and it was on a billboard where people can see it. It passed and passed and that October, I met a young lady who had just got a kidney transplant. She said she got it from UC Davis and I told her, you know, I tried there, but it seemed like the enemy was just against me, so I left it alone. And I said, okay, I'm gonna go home and I'm gonna try it, which you told me. And I believed everything. Me and my dad got the next shipment or flight to go out there to talk to them, to set up everything, arrange everything. And that was the start of a different transplant list in San Francisco that kept denying me for 11 years. We went out there, everything was on board, but then again, somehow, the enemy caught us again. We were playing phone tag. My question was, well, will my insurance pay for this? Take everything, take care of everything, because if not, I don't know what I'm gonna do again. You know, maybe this is not my time. Phones had for months and Sundays, finally they give me a call. Miss Lane, you're ready to go on the list, but we need lab work for you. Okay, here we go again. We're shipping out lab work back to back and forth. It got lost. All kind of things just aren't happening. They finally called me in September 15th and said, September 13th and said, we will be mailing you a letter to let you know you're placed on the list. Um, in a weekend, the first, I, I, the lady said, any day. And I said, okay, I'm gonna believe you. I'm gonna believe this this time. The weekend went past on the Monday. The letter was at home at five o'clock. And I told my dad, look that, like the, the letter is here, like I'm on this list. You know, pack your bags, get ready. 5.15, I opened the letter and said that. 5.30. I got a call from UC Davis. In the pandemic, and they just, you know, asked me the questions that I have been dying to hear. No, I don't have none of them symptoms. Well, it looks like we have a kidney for you. God is so good. I, I, I told my dad, don't tell nobody. Because we got to make sure this is for sure this time. <laughs> dad, I love you. And I know you're out there watching, but you told people. We got, we got on the next Amtrak out there, and I just said, I get quiet. I'm very silent. But he told people, and I'm just like, listen, like, they don't even know just yet. We got there, and I had to be tested all over again. I had to wait hours and hours, and I'm just like, hear my phone, hear his phone, just going off, going off. I'm like, okay, Dad. Like, but then when they said it's time, this is for you. <laughs> This is for you. I, t I feel like I took the first deep breath again. And it was the most breathtaking breath I ever took. 
since dealing with this illness. <sighs> September 16th, I had a kidney transplant. After 11 long years c connected to a machine that's keeping me alive, and I just thought, you know, hey, that battle was always mine. And I conquered it, and I beat it, and I defeated everything that came against me and what the doctor said I couldn't do, could do. I did that. And I don't owe that to nobody but him above. I don't know where I'd be without him at all. And I'm glad for this journey. If I had to do it all over again, I got this. I got all of this, and I've been had it because he created me from the start like this. I didn't just equip and, and gather things. I did, but he knew who he created when he created me, Shayana Lane. And that's all I can say is, you know, thanks, thank God, and the glory all to him. Amen. And Amen. that's my story. <laughs> The Lord is good, everyone. The Lord is good, and his mercy is everlasting. I'm so grateful to be, y'all don't understand, I'm so grateful to be here, and you'll, you'll understand in just a moment. But I'm very grateful for my walk with this horrible disease. So you go to the first slide. It should be back here soon. Like, not double-sided. My eyes are healthy, but my vision is not. <laughs> okay, here we go. So it all starts towards the end of 2005. Now what you see is my husband proposing to me on Christmas Day in 2005 at my church. That morning he was a nervous wreck. I was like, you wanna eat some breakfast? He's like, no, no, my stomach hurt. I mean, like, he said, I feel like I gotta throw up. I said, well, like, eat some salt. You'll be all right, right? So, and my husband, if anybody knows my husband, he's always hungry, okay? So that morning he wasn't, I was like, well, what's wrong with him? And then um, my pastor, the late Gordon Humphrey Jr., he, um, I guess he had something going on with my, with my husband, and so he had my husband come up, because at the time my husband played semi-pro football, thank the Lord that it's over with. <laughs> and so um, my pastor told him to come up, so I thought he was coming to speak about semi-pro football, come to the next game, blah, blah, blah. He proposed, and if you look to the right, that's my hand, it was swollen. Um, in November, I was having a lot of pain, swollen joints, hurtful joints, very tired, and um, so when he gave me the ring, the ring actually, we forced it on. Because I was like, I'm wearing my ring. Yeah. I don't care, nobody say. He's like, well, we gotta take off your fit. I said, we get it fit on Tuesday. But today, I'm wearing my ring. So my ring, my finger almost turning purple keeping this ring on. But I was wearing it. So um, the next slide. So this is at my grandfather's house. We went to my grandfather's house because uh, Christmas Day, uh, we had dinner at his house. And so those are the pictures we took in the hallway of his house. He currently lives in Richmond now. He'll be 90 this year. I'm his birthday gift because my birthday's the next day. <laughs> and then um, as time went on, um, living with lupus, it started doing a lot of things to my body. Um, I don't wanna say disfiguration, but my body structure has changed. So to the next slide. Um, here, my skin on, the skin on my face has started getting rashes. I never really got butterfly rashes, which is one of the rashes that um, you can get living with lupus. But my face started breaking out. 
Um, and I took very good care of my skin. And so this kind of, you know, was working on me mentally. Next slide. This is my stomach. You can't really see my back on here, but it's a really big red rash towards the back. And on my legs, there's really small bumps. Those were all rashes. But you see on my stomach on the first picture is really, it itched really bad. The ratchet, rashes were really bad. And I just would try to prevent, my husband like, stop scratching. I'm like, I can't. You know, it hurt really bad. So go to the next slide. So with this slide, I was, at the time, when I first was diagnosed with lupus, I was 206 pounds, a denial 16. I was wearing 14, knew I was supposed to be in 16, I wasn't gonna get it. <laughs> and so I made up in my mind, because also at that time, I was having flare-ups back to back to back. I would have one, it would stop, a couple weeks later, it was back. So I was like, I gotta prevent this, so that circle with the slash meant no more weight. So I lost the weight and I was down 64 pounds and I've been down 64 pounds for 13 years. Um, and so I now, if I have a flare up, it'll just be one flare up, but for an extended period of time, which I really don't like, but at least I can kind of track where the pain, how long, whatever the case may be. And um, with the medications during this time period, so when I first started, I was on Plaquenil, I was on sales tab. These are different medications that you take as a lupus patient. I'm allergic to Plaquenil, so those rashes intensified. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I can't do this anymore. So once I started losing weight, I started taking, I started adjusting my body to some of the medication and supplements. Realized that supplements was the best way for me to go, and that's when I decided to take the natural route to help to heal my body. Um, and so one year, I actually went to my rheumatologist, who's an um, old white Jewish guy, and I, he was like, okay, so are you on this medication? I was like, no. He was like, are you taking this medication? I was like, no. He was like, are you on any medication I prescribe to you? I was like, no. <laughs> and he was like, and you're fine? I said, yeah, he said, keep doing what you're doing. He didn't even stop me. He said, Any, if anything changes, you let me know. And he's actually the um, doctor that diagnosed me, and he's been my doctor ever since. And so one thing I do appreciate is that, like she said, you have to do research and know what your body can take and what it can't take and advocate for yourself if you tell the doctor right. what, this is what my body needs. Because doctors, even now, still don't yeah. know yeah. how to treat this disease. Yeah. So you have to tell them how this disease works for you and what you're going to do. This is what I need you to do. This is what works. There was a time, mm, I think my middle child was maybe two, and I ended up going into the hospital. I think it's Mount Eden, was then Mount Eden, but it's now Summit in Castro Valley. and my blood count was so low because I have chronic anemia. And so they gave me a blood transfusion. I was not happy with taking somebody else's blood. And so um, as I talk further along, um, you know, I do iron infusions. Iron infusions does take a little longer to get you back on track with your um, blood count and your hemoglobin, but it works. And so when I went into the doctor, when I was in the hospital for one hospital visit, a doctor said, well, we need to go give you a blood transfusion. I said, no, you don't. And he said, yes, we do. Your blood counts low. I said, you don't need to give me blood transfusion, but you can give me an iron infusion. And he said, but it'll take a little longer. I said, but it'll work. Right. And so he said, okay. So then I had a phone call from the hospital room um, phone. It was the second doctor talking, talking, talking. You need a blood transfusion. That's fine. I'm going to take the iron infusion. Third doctor called. I'm like, I'm not scared of no doctors. First of all, you, you're talking to the right person to tell you not. And so, and if anybody knows me, and my husband says it a lot, I'm stubborn, and he's right. Um, but it works for the good and the bad. Um, but you have to advocate for yourself. And so I did ended up, in, I ended up taking, having my iron infusions, three day process, and my numbers slowly went back up, but they went up. 
And so if you, um, you can go to the next screen. Um, back on the full screen, thank you. So if you look here, in the month of May, I haven't done it these past two years, but every month of May, I will wear purple every single day. Yes, I had purple for 30 days. <laughs> and if you look to the left, I have a green ribbon because this month is also mental wear this month. And so um, I take that really to heart now because this time, you know, four years ago when I was in the hospital, I went through a state of depression in the hospital. What got me out of it was like, Shanette, you have too many more outfits you need to put together. <laughs> and that's how I got out of it, no lie. I kid you not, you can do the next slide. And so that's another um, picture when I had on my purple, but I definitely represented, and also on social media for 30 days, I had um, a, a fun fact of lupus awareness because a lot of people didn't know what was going on. You go to the next screen. So this is a, right after a lupus walk. My hair had been falling out, but the second picture of the line of hair loss, I had a weave in my hair because I was very self-conscious about my hair falling out. And so I didn't want people to know what my head was looking like. So I always kept a weave in my hair. But that, for my hair being gone, was the glue from the hair pulling on it. And so you see a lot of patches in my head. And at the time, I think my middle child was two. Two or three, yeah, he was two because he wasn't really talking. Um, and so I asked my husband, he was in the game room playing Madden. And so I went in the bathroom that night. I mean, while he was playing, I went in the bathroom, closed the door, and I cried for 10 minutes. I cried, I cried, I cried. I came out of the bathroom, I said, Tino, and you cut my hair. He said, cut it? Like what? I said, ball. He said, like a close cut? I said, no, like your head. And so he's like, all right. And I didn't, at first I didn't, well, no, I never did. I never asked him, you know, how he felt about it. Because number one, I knew my husband liked hair. And I would never put myself in a position to be disappointed by asking him if he liked it, expecting an honest answer right. and get that honest right. answer. Yeah. So you have to be mindful. Right. If you're asking yeah. something from somebody, yeah. expect yeah. to get the honest answer. Yeah. And don't be mad if you get that honest answer, it's not something you like. So I just made sure I didn't ask it. And so he went ahead and cut my hair completely bald. Next screen. So he cut it, and if you look on the left side, you can't really tell, but it's kind of red because my skin was so agitated from that weave in my head. And I went to work that next day, because the lupus walk was on Sunday. That next day I went to work with a wig on. Hill College, downtown San Francisco. The second day I went to work with that wig on. It was itching so bad. Walking back to Bart, I yanked it off, <laughs> threw it in the garbage. I said, to heck with this. Yeah. That Wednesday morning, I came in, and you know how liberal San Francisco is. Came in my um, work building, and they were like, oh my God, you look amazing. I'm like, hey, <laughs> self-esteem, boost it right back up. I was, so, I was so happy to be embraced, but that night, that um, my husband cut my hair. Um, he, I knew he wasn't okay with it, but after he cut my hair, it was really bothering me. I was like, Tino, can you like get something to put on my head? It's just really, it's itching really bad. He got a hot towel and just placed it on my head and started rubbing it. And then he put grease on my head and just was massaging it. That let me know he was okay with it and he was gonna deal with it regardless of how he felt about it, and that made me feel really, really good. So I don't think I ever told you that, but I appreciate that. I really do. Um, still ain't never asked him how he liked my hair. <laughs> okay, so um, before you go to the next slide, so May 27th to June 4th, we're fast forwarding some years. Um, May 27th to June 4th, uh, 2019, I was in a hospital 
from a really bad lupus flare up. And it caused me to not be able to walk. So I had really no activity in my limbs. And when I was released, I was released with a walker. But in order for me to use that walker, I had to do some walking in the hospital. And so we started off with them lifting me up in the, um, out of the bed and putting me back on the bed. After that, I was done for the day. You, you could do just about anything. I was just, I was done. And so um, go to the next screen. The first outing was at my friend's, um, it's not coming up, it's weird. Oh, there it is. So that's at my friend's wedding. My friend Cheyenne got married in June of 2018. It, can it play? I don't know if you could, I don't know if it'll play or not, but as you can see, that was my first outing and I was on the walker. And that's actually a video. I was, um, if it can't play, don't worry about it. But that's actually a video of me on my walker. One of my favorite songs at a wedding is um, The Wobble. I was sitting in my seat. I heard the wobble come when I said, oh. <laughs> Somebody come bring me my walker, please. And I went on the dance floor and wobbled with my walker. And at that time, you know, people were really praying for me because they knew, and it's something about the summer months. Does that happen to you? The summer months, it gets really, really bad. And so, during that summer, I did not finish out. I worked for the Oakland School District. And during that, that year, um, I didn't finish out the school year. My, the kids at the school were wondering what happened to Miss Jeanette. And I, was, and I couldn't do anything. So when they saw me when I came back, they were really excited. But I, I just couldn't finish it out. But I would come to work as sick as I was, barely walking, because I was under a micromanaging principal. Um, anytime I was off work, it was because of lupus, but because you can't fire me due to, due to sickness, she watched my every move. And so um, it got worse, it got worse to the point I just couldn't go back to work. And so I stayed off and was able to go back that next school year, but then that's when um, the pandemic hit. So um, you can go to the next screen. This is fast forwarding to February 2022. Actually, this is like January 2022. My hair started falling out again. Now, one thing that lupus visibly attacks is my head. And so, um, or my hair, alopecia really, really bad. And so you see a lot of blotches in my hair. You can see it really a lot because I was blonde for a few years. And so when my hair started falling out, you could go to the next screen. It was patches everywhere. And my hair was just falling out. Just one, It got to the point I was at school and one of the students, she was like, Missionette, do you know that your hair is falling out in the back? And I was like, oh, okay, thank, thank you, thank you. So very much, she's like, not a problem. I was like, oh, God. But these kids will keep you on your toes, I'm telling you. And because I don't, in, the, in this sense, my feelings don't get hurt as bad because people really don't know. Whether they're adults, they're children, they really don't know what's going on when it comes to lupus. So I was just like, okay. Let me give it, let me pick my face back up off the floor because she really busted me out. And so, um, nevertheless, even though my hair was falling out, you go to the next screen. So this is February of last year. I was in my friend's wedding. My husband's brother, he cut my hair and still had me looking good. So I knew I was looking good. And I was on the dance floor. This is when they introduced the bridesmaids. That was me coming out to E40, tell me where to go. That's my song, y'all. <laughs> And so um, then forwarding to um, May of last year, it's, the lupus started, I mean, it was blazing. 
and I just really, I got really, really tired. It took everything in me to get out of bed. Um, also, actually, actually, let me rewind a little bit. Four years ago when I was in the hospital and I was on the walker, they did a kidney biopsy on me because when I was initially diagnosed with lupus, I was diagnosed with systemic lupus, which is supposed to be the worst out of the lupus that you have because it does affect your organs, all of your organs at any given time or not. And so they noticed it was a lot of protein in my urine. And so that's when they were testing, that's when they did a kidney biopsy. And a year after that, they did another biopsy because the first time they did it, they pulled tissue out of my back. And that's when they found out that lupus, systemic lupus turned into lupus nephritis. So it does affect my kidneys. Stage four lupus nephritis. There's stage five stages of lupus nephritis. Stage four, you're supposed to be on dialysis. I have yet to go to a, a dialysis center. I have never had to be on dialysis and I'm very grateful. And my protein, the protein was at positive four, is down to positive two. And I have moved down to stage two, lupus nephritis. And a lot of that is because of the choices I made eating. Um, now I will splurge, but that's because if, I'm, if I know I want some dessert, I'm gonna have one plate of food so I can have some dessert because I didn't work a whole year to get this weight off and then to get it back on, right? So 13 years later, I still know how to maintain and keep my balance and keep this weight off. So I'm very grateful for that. So, um, but the, every, every time I go back, I just, I'm grateful because I could be on dialysis. I already knew how to deal with it because my father that raised me um, had renal failure. He had renal failure for 11 years before he passed away. He didn't even pass away from renal failure. It was from a heart attack. But, and I took care of him at home. He, he, took, he had the hemodialysis where he did it at home. And so I was prepared for it. But through it all, I, I had my support from my family. So even though, and I'm sure my husband still probably doesn't understand all of what I deal with, a lot of it is because I don't show it. I don't like pity. I don't want you to feel sorry for me. My kid, my middle child, you good? Yeah, I'm fine. Christian was like, Mom, do you need anything? Do you need me to get you some food? No. And then my oldest, Kamari, he would, um, which is what I'm about to get to, but he was my caregiver the last time I was in the hospital. So um, if you go to the next screen, so here, this is June 25th of last year. Um, in May, I was in the hospital for three days and came out May 29th and May 31st. And I came out and um, I still wasn't feeling good um, during that time. But little after I got out of the hospital, my middle child was transitioning to high school. And so we drove out to the school that um, my husband was looking at for him to go to. And because I was on the walker, they basically asked me not to come because it would be a lot of walking. And so I stayed in the car for a couple of hours, but I was just, I was fatigued. Just trying to put on my clothes to get in the car, it was a lot. My husband's like, you gotta come, you gotta come, you gotta come. I was like, I can't, I'm drained. And so I slept all the way, his school's in San Francisco, and I slept from Antioch to San Francisco and stayed in that car for two hours. At that point, I was done. I just, I was out of it. So I had in-home care. A nurse came, she was bathing me, and she was God sent, because she went to the church that we were attending in Antioch, and talking, found that out. She was like, yeah, girl, I've been at that church. I was there for a few years, and then when um, my uncle took over the church, she had left like a little bit before that, but she prayed over me. She constantly was praying for me and was a good resource for my family. She helped me to get resources for my oldest son to help him to get a job and all this other kind of stuff. So she was very helpful in my life. But one particular day, June 25th of last year, she was helping me bathe. And I was in the shower in my chair 
in the shower chair and I was like, I'm tired, I'm sleepy. And so I was leaning and she was like, Shanette, you gotta stay up. And I was like, but I'm tired. She was like, Shanette, you gotta stay up. I said, I just wanna lay my head on the shower door. And she was like, Shanette, and that's the only, that's the last thing I remember. Next thing I knew, I could remember opening my eyes a little bit and I felt like I was in the back of a delivery truck and I felt like they were trying to deliver me somewhere and I'm trying to figure out how to get out the truck. Now, as I look back, I realize I was at the emergency doors of the hospital. And then I closed my eyes. Seven days later, I was in a coma is what I'm gonna call it because I don't know any other way to put it. I was in a coma for seven days. And so that first picture, if you could go back to the full screen, that first picture, you see how dark I was, gray, like no light. But I was on, I had no machine on me, no anything. I was just asleep for seven days. My eyes were moving, but they never opened. Middle picture, I was awake and looking at that hand, it looks like my oldest son's hand was on the bed. And I was pointing, I guess, maybe at my mom, but I don't even remember that. And then the pictures to the right are pictures when they were trying to help me to walk. And even then my skin was just, it was, they, it was really gray. Um, that may have been the first day out of the coma. I lost 23 pounds and I'm already small. So the 23 pounds looked horrible. And the blankets I have on me felt like 50 pound weights. I couldn't even lift my leg to get it off. And trying to reach to pull it off was a lot of work. Um, you can go to the next screen. So this is at my friend's wedding. I think I mixed the pictures up, but this is at my friend's wedding. I made, I stayed home, did everything I could to stay home because I had to make sure that I was at her wedding in June. And I was there at her wedding and I was grateful to be there on my walker. At the reception, they played the wobble. <laughs> but I stayed in my seat this time with the walker. <laughs> and so um, you could go to the next screen. This just shows a picture that I guess I took, well I had to have, took it when I was in the bed showing, taking a picture of flowers. And then to the right is my water bottle that I had people that showed up when I was in the coma, they put their visitor's badge on the water bottle. And I still had the, I ended up buying another water bottle because I didn't want to use that bottle anymore and I still have it. But people I would have never expected to show up were there. You could go to the next screen. When I came home, I came home with all of those pills. I don't know what half of those pills are, but those are the pills that I came home with. Go to the next screen. So now here we are, fast forward to October of last year. To the left is me at my 46th birthday party. And then to the right, I'm wearing a shirt that says, Still I Rise. And um, which does speak volumes because it seems like every single time the devil tries to attack me, I pop back up as if nothing happened. And I've been at my lowest. My kids have seen me at my lowest, but it's like not for long. So I don't even think they really think that I can get sick. You know, because it's always like if something is wrong or they can't fix something. Mom, can you come fix this? Why are you ask your dad? Because you can fix everything. And I just like just they think I'm superwoman. They think I'm super, but I don't show it. I don't show that I'm not, I guess. Go to the next screen. And so now I'm working my businesses. I have a dessert business, I have an organizing business. I do it full time. I'm still employed with the school district, but I made up in my mind I'm not going back there. <laughs> I don't wanna be under that stress anymore. Give me a different kind of, of weight. But there, I love my kids to death at the school but I can't be under that kind of stress anymore. So I've been working my business full time, but it also gives me more access to my children. Um, being at all of my youngest son's field trips, because in one more year, he won't have field trips that his mom to go to. 
And so for me to be able to go, for me to be able to cook for his class, he has a very small class, and the kids, one of the kids came up to me last Thursday, Miss Shanae, can you bring me some ribs? They were so good. I said, well, I didn't season them, but I did grill them. She was like, well, can you bring me some barbecue chicken? And so the kids even love what I do for them at the school. So to be able to have that extra time to do what I need to do to compensate for what my husband isn't able to do because of his schedule, as far as the kids are concerned, I'm available now. And I'm very grateful for that because this, this hateful and hurtful disease has also opened doors for me. I've started my businesses right in the thick of the pandemic and they're still going great. The next screen. So this is me, this is the end. No matter what you do, what you try to do, the devil, he's busy, but I got this. I got this. Come on, let's give it up for these ladies. In this powerful, powerful testimony. Amen. Amen. We thank God. Thank God for them. And thank God for them sharing their testimonies with us. But I did ask them one thing, and I asked them if they would be willing, if they would be willing to um, entertain any questions. So for, for just a couple of moments, if, if, they, if you have any questions, go and have your seat. Have a, we're, gonna, we're not going to be here much longer, but if you have a question that you'd like to ask them, um, let's have them to entertain those questions real quick. Anybody? Are y'all a perfect audience, huh? Y'all are y'all ready to go? <laughs> Somebody said that part. Um, yes, you do. <laughs> it's for the people online. Um, okay. I just wanted to know at what point did you start having symptoms and then when did you receive your diagnosis for lupus? How long did that take? Um, for me, like I said, I'm an athlete. I've never been sick a day in my life until I had a week off from basketball practice. Um, and in an amount of hours, my body was shutting down. I kept falling asleep. Like I said, I feel like literally I was drugged. Sunday in church, I was just trying to stay up with my best friend and I couldn't do it. And I knew I needed to go to the hospital, but I didn't go right away. Um, for two days, I had high fever. I was laying in my bed. I couldn't move, couldn't do nothing. Lower back was hurting. Um, and just in pain. Um, when I went to the hospital, the labs came back automatically. You need to be, you need to be here, um, or less. You could have died a long time ago. But me, I'm, I'm a fighter. I keep going. Like as many hits as I get, I'm still about to keep going. So that's what I did until it set me down. And then that's when they start doing all kinds of tests and thought it was this and thought it was that. Um, in about five days, they diagnosed me with lupus. But before that, they were giving me medicines also. You know, um, the steroids, blood pressure medicines, and so on. And in five days, I had a lupus diagnosis. Um, but from a kidney biopsy, that's what determined that. Um, and now I'm, here I am today. Um, like she said, the, the butterfly rash, a lot of things I didn't have. Just the chronic fatigue, um, maybe lower back pain, and pain. But just being an athlete, I already had joint problems, or I already, my body would hurt, but it didn't hurt till I, I had a, a week or a weekend off from my body not being active. So as today, I'm still moving because I don't know what could happen if I just sit down. It's not great for me. And that's been how I was diagnosed for those symptoms and everything. Thank you. You're welcome. And for me, it, it took about a well, it could have been sooner, but it took a month because it was a month before um, once I did my testing and being able to see the doctor again. So it was January 6th of 2006 is when he gave me the diagnosis. Mine is hereditary. So my mom has discoid lupus, which is not as bad as systemic, but if you don't take care of your body, it can turn into systemic. So she, she works out five days a week on her Peloton machine. She just got a Peloton machine, but she, Hers is a combination now of rheumatoid arthritis, so she has them both that she deals with. But yeah, it took about a month for me. To go back to what she said, and you, it's 
not hereditary. It's nowhere in my family, and that that's also why I was like, there's another reason for this. You mean to tell me I get this and we don't know why, and you can't tell me where this come from? And so that gave me all the greater more reasons to research and try to do and find the knowledge for my life. Um, which is systemic. We both have aromatosis, systemic, the worst disease of lupus. From head to toe, it can you know, turn our body inside out if it wanted to. Um, like she said, it can turn to systemic if you don't take care of your body, not just on a diet, not just physical, it's mental also. Um, you know, the mind is a crazy thing and it's, I think for us, it's, we have to lean on God. Cause if we don't, we won't be here longer. It, things will ridicule our body just cause of what environment we are in. And so we have to prepare ourselves, like she said, she had to prepare herself to make sure she gets her best friends, her, her the um, what, reception. We have to mentally prepare ourselves to go places on a day-to-day -day basis or we will not go. And it's nothing personal, but our body is like, no. And we have to listen. Um, how often do you both have flare-ups now and do you have any warning that it's coming, or is just? I guess I'll start for me. There was no warning. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I was fine in the daytime, and you know, pain, illness gets worse as it goes towards the evening. And so I was good all day, and then I just, I just started dragging towards the evening. And I'm like, my body hurts. I'm tired. I'm, oh, I need to go lay down. And so at any given point, it can happen. You, you, it's, there's no notification. And like she was saying with um, the fevers, even if you have um, Tylenol and stuff like that because it's a lupus fever, you really can't control it. It kind of like has to go away on its own. So I just don't take medicine at all to even for that to go down. And then the, you asked the first question, that was the second question. Does it have any warnings? Oh yeah, no warnings. And um, for me, they don't come often, they just last long. So this last step I had, which it ended up having me in the hospital in June, it started in February. And it lasted all the way, but it just got worse, not because of anything I did, it's just, it just took a toll and took over my body. For me, um, at first it just come, and I just would take them. Because what, what else can I do? Um, at some point, you know, all kind of medicines was evolved, but it, it didn't work no more. Um, it was like, okay, now I, I gotta do something. You know, I have to figure out a way to relax or just get rid of things. Um, I did that. I tried wellness stuff. I tried holistic, calming, you know, soothing mindfulness things just to relax me so my body wouldn't go haywire. Um, everything under the sun hit us. Like she said, the summer, the heat will take us out for weeks and Sundays. And it's nothing we can do about it. Um, I had to learn that we can't control it. We can control what it does to us by what we allow. And so that's what helped me. Today, every day, I don't live in pain each and every day like I did from 2010 to 2015 at all. I don't take any medicine. Um, like I said, I know a stress is a response for me. Um, so I just make sure I'm not in stressful environments. I don't take things personal. I try to understand that that's a you problem and it's not mine. And I keep going about my life because I can't let you stress me out because you don't know how I'm gonna feel when I go behind my closed doors. I may suffer in silence because I'd rather not make two wrongs be that thing, but it's okay for me to not do that. You know, so other than that, I don't really have anything, no pain, I don't, I don't have that. Um, like I was telling my aunt, I worked a little bit more about two weeks ago, back to back, back to back for about four or five days straight. I've been having problems with my foot because out of my normal routine, that's not what I usually do. I may just pick it up, but when it becomes something permanent that's not normal for me, it will take my body out. Now I'll have pain, now I have pain. Um, I had to put on a certain pair of shoes to get here today or I didn't, I, I trembled, I, I crumbled, didn't know how I was gonna make it today but I have to deal with that, you know, and that's okay if that's all I have to deal with, but it comes and goes. It's just like, don't do nothing you wouldn't do. You know, take care of you at the end of the day. You can't worry about nobody else. And that will loosen us and the stuff we carry 
for us, it weighs on us. Like just being in a, a social environment will stress us out for two days or three days just because, but it's that or we act out upon it. And me, I always learn is like I said, no two wrongs will make a right. So I just continue to keep it and you know try to bear with it the best way I can. And I don't have symptoms that way and that's peaceful to me. Good afternoon. Um, I, I was diagnosed with discoid lupus at 30 years old, and I'm 80 now. I also have rheumatoid arthritis. My rheumatoid arthritis was, a, was something that I was not expecting. I was at work. My left knee started aching, aching really bad. And, oh, maybe I bumped it on the desk. Maybe I, you know, maybe I bumped it. The next week, it was like a mirror. The right knee did the same thing. That pain was so excruciating. And I know that I did not bump my knee. So I went to the doctor, and that's when they gave me all that blood work and everything. And that's when I was diagnosed with discoid lupus and rheumatoid arthritis. But I'm 80 and I know that this is nothing but God that's keeping me alive. He's nothing but God, nothing but him. This is his journey for me. It's not about me, it's about his journey for me. And I just thank him for that. I could never, if I had a thousand tongues, I couldn't thank him enough for that. If I had a thousand ways to lift my Hands, I couldn't lift them high enough. It's nothing but the grace of God for me. Yeah. Come on, give God the praise. <laughs> One more last question here. Um, I have a, a, my uncle is dealing with lupus very, very bad. And uh, my uncle, he's dealing with lupus bad. And I'm getting kind of emotional thinking about because I didn't, I didn't want to know does it affect the man? Because he's lost functions of his arm. So he can't pick up a cup to drink or nothing. We have to, so it affects men the same way yeah. as for Yeah, women. we actually um, have a um, church member. His name is Greg, and he has lupus as well. And um, it does affect him now. And he's a longshoreman. So with him being a longshoreman and having this disease, it really, you know, he has back issues. Um, a lot of it is weight, but he does have back issues. And a, a lot of times he is down. Neuropathy is one thing that connects with lupus. Like I'm dealing with neuropathy in my ear right now. And neuropathy acts like the nerve cells are dead. And so because of that, like, you end up getting dry skin because your your body, your skin is saying, I'm dead, so I don't need to keep living. And so you gotta stay hydrated, but neuropathy, definitely. My mom has it in her foot, and her foot gets really scaly because she, there's no feeling there. And so with me, like, kind of like having no feeling in my ear, like I can feel myself rubbing it, but it, it's not taking the scratch away. It's itching, oh, I'm sorry, it won't take the itch away. So if I scratch it, it still itches because that neuropathy is just like, I don't feel nothing. You're not doing anything. Yeah. Are you done? To, Amen. To piggyback off of what she said and what you said, um, like our cells are supposed to protect us. Unfortunately, in certain people's situation, it turns against us. So one thing I thought through this her journey was, for me to feel all bad is what I'm feeling. I haven't been hit by a car. Nothing physically came against me. It was all internally. So if it's all internally, it's whatever is going on each and every day of our lives. And that only told me that was God is great good at showing me what was happening really to me and that either we can claim this or we don't have to. The more I claim something, I didn't feel like it. I had all of the diseases. I had all of it, and I felt it. And it was like, but I don't even feel this on a day-to-day -day basis. But you have to nourish your cells. We need it more than anything. If you don't do that, it's going to turn against you no matter what it is. 
but for us in those predicaments. Other than that, you just have to take care of yourself, which is we just need it 10 times more. So we have a, one quick special presentation, and, I, and then I'm gonna close out. But God, oh my goodness, I knew both of these young ladies. This one, I was in the room when she was born, and this one here, I've known right. since she was a baby. Right. Um, my Ashley's God sister and watching her run around, I did not even know you had Lupus Jeanette. So today was an eye opener for me. But I stand today to do a presentation to Shayana, and this is not from me, your Auntie Nate, this is from your dad. The outfit you have on that you asked me to do for you, your dad paid for. Okay? These flowers are from your dad and Star, and he just wanted me to read his words because he couldn't get here because of the short notice. He moved to Atlanta about not even a year ago, but you're still his baby girl. And he said, to my baby girl, Shayana. He says, Star and I extend our love, our appreciation, and our support to you on this day. You are a blessing. You are an inspiration. Words cannot express how proud we are of you for your accomplishments. Being a spokesperson for this disease called lupus, you are a great example of a true lupus warrior. And that's what your shirt says. Your family honors your strength and your determination in your continued fight. We send our love and support for a job well done. I wish we could have been there for you. A special remark from your dad, watching you go through this struggle when you were young and still trying to play top level basketball, All right. you became my shero. I love you, you're my baby girl. This is from Duke, Star, Patrice, Devin, your uncles and your aunties. We love you. And one last note, for your mom to push through and to be here with you today, I'm so proud of you. I have to say that. I love you. I love Amen. you. Amen. Amen. Bring up that. I want you. Amen. Thank God for um, thank God for this. Wasn't this wonderful? Amen. This, and I told them before. I told them before service that they were our sermon for today. And this is a powerful message that they're sharing because we have to do like the, their slogan that said, make lupus visible. Amen. Because you never know. Like my sister said, she never knew about Jeanette. You know, there's so many people that are going through this and you never know. You can look at them and you think that they're, everything is fine and everything's going well with them, but they could be going through something internally. Amen. So, again, give it up for them. Amen. Amen. Um, I wanted, um, I wanted, uh, Johnny, can you, you know how to share it? Grab it, grab it, and slide it upwards. Grab the window and slide it up. Or over to the right. What I wanted you all to do is that in order for us to make sure that um, that the research continues. Um, like um, Shanette said, the doctors don't know everything there is about this. So what you need to do is to be able to just share it. Um, so you can go to the Lupus Foundation of America and donate to the research for this. Um, the church is going to be sending an offering over. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. We're gonna be sending an offering over to, um, to the research and then I want to invite all of you all that can, even listening to me, you can also go to this website and give directly online to them um, because we want to be a blessing to all of those that are living with this disease. Amen. And don't these ladies look fabulous? Amen. They, they look fabulous. And we want to just give it up for them um, because you never know. I mean, um, I was... Um, on this website itself, that's Takari. Remember Takari from American Next Top Model? She's a, a, a lupus um, survivor as well. So she's living with lupus as well. And my girl, Tony Braxton. I mean, we, 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 Tony and I are personal friends. And she is, she is also living with lupus. I mean, I got pictures on my phone. 
I can show y'all that we personal friends. Amen. But but she is a, she has lupus as well, and so you never know who is going through this. And we just want to be a blessing to all those that um, we can. So if you can donate, 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 we'll have a, a um, we'll have a basket right up here on the stage. You can bring something if you want to put it with what the church is going to do. You're welcome to do so. Thank you, ladies, for being with us today. You made our worship, you made our service today. Amen. So give it up for them. Amen. Amen. Is there anybody that want to accept Jesus today? Before we go, we have to make sure we give an opportunity. If you want to return all of these visitors that, that used to be part of fame, y'all want to return today, you're welcome to come and be part of this fellowship again. Amen. Those that are listening to us online, we offer Christ to you. Stand all over the house where you are, and we're getting ready to leave this place. For the, and I just thank God for Antonio, my drummer. Amen. He came here. He played for me when I was over in San Francisco, one of the best drummers I had. Amen. Right. And then um, his boys, the young man, the one right here with the um, blonde top of the Asian hand, you can see him on, online. They post pictures of him just wrestling. Amen. Wrestling in football, too. Now, all of them are in sports because the husband was in sports. Antonio's in sports. Amen. Let's, um, as we get ready to leave, just bow your heads with me. God, we thank you and we praise you, God, for what our eyes have seen, our ears have heard, oh God. We thank you, oh God, for these um, ladies, these messengers, these ambassadors for lupus, oh God, the awareness of it, God. We pray that we'll, something that we did today will help make lupus more of visible to everybody that, that sees it, reads it, Lord, and follows us on this service, oh God. We pray that it'll reach all over the world. We thank you, oh God, for the testimony of these young ladies because Lord just like they said they don't look like what they've been through because you're an awesome God and you're keeping them and you're continuing to keep them so God in the name of Jesus God we, we lift them up before you oh God that, that you would just keep them not only today but in the coming days God that as the flare ups come back or as those moments where their body begin to attack itself Lord we pray that you would not only keep them Lord but Bring the healing that they need, God. This just where it be only a reminder of what they're going through, but they won't be um, dealt with so heavily and so hard in their bodies, God. In the name of Jesus, bless the families. Lord, bless all the people that are here today. And then as we leave this place, oh God, we pray that you would just keep us in your keeping power till we come back together to give you praise again and again to give you all the praise that you do in Jesus name and for his sake we'll see y'all again next week same time same station